reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Dr. Hayek, I think if there's uh, one area in which I uh, disagree with you slightly, it is that about we were discussing about intellectuals. Uh, and I, uh, I guess it is that I see something a little more sinister about them than you do. Uh, isn't it significant that uh, as you watch the intellectual classes, they, they tend to move the society always in one direction? that is towards more regulation, towards mm -hmm. more intervention, towards more politicization of the economy. And that you notice on campuses, uh, at least the campuses I'm familiar with, an enormous resistance by very bright people to what are really fairly basic and simple ideas of economics, mm -hmm. which suggests, uh, may suggest that something more than intellectual error is at work. Is it, uh, do you know? the resistance against being guided by something which is unintelligible to them is, I think, quite in understandable in an intellectual. Go back to the origin of it all. Descartes, of course, explicitly argued only that we should not believe anything which we did not understand. But he applied it, and his followers immediately applied it, that we should not accept any rules which we did not understand. And the intellectual has very strongly this feeling that what is not comprehensible must be nonsense. And to him the rules he is required to obey are unintelligible and therefore nonsense. Uh, he defines rational almost as intelligible. Anything which is not intelligible to him is automatically irrational, and he's opposed to it. Well, f I'll give you an, an, an example. Uh, in, uh, among academic economists, and among academic lawyers who deal with economics, mm. antitrust, for example, there has been an enormous acceptance of uh, certain theories about oligopoly, about concentrated industries that where you have three, four, five, six firms in a market, they will behave without colluding, necessarily mm -hmm. as a monopolist would behave. They will learn to act together as if they were a monopolist. There seems almost no evidence for that theory. Mm -hmm. But it's enormously popular. And it seems to me, uh, uh, the, w without a predisposition on the part of intellectuals to dislike the private sector and to dislike freedom in the economic sphere, that that theory could hardly have become as popular as it has become. Yes, but that dislike, I think, is due to it being unintelligible to them. They want to make it intelligible, translucent to them. They think nothing can be good unless it's demonstrated to you that in the particular case it achieves a good object. And then, of course, it's impossible. You can only understand the structure as uh, the principle of it, but you couldn't possibly demonstrate that in the particular event, the particular change has a purpose because it always is connected with the whole system, which is a whole. You can un only understand in principle, but not in detail. So I, I think I would give them the benefit of the doubt, at least. I think in most instances, it's a deeply ingrained intellectual attitude which forces them to disapprove of something which is, seems to them intelligible and to prefer something which is visibly directed to a good purpose. Do you think it has to do with the nature of intellectual work? Yes. With the whole training of the scientist and uh, well of course the uh, scientists scientists are pretty bad but they're not as bad as what i call the intellectual the second hand dealers of ideas you know 
they are really the worst part. But I think the men who's learned a little science, the little general problems, lacks the humility the real scientist gradually acquires. Uh, the typical intellectual believes everything must be explainable, while the scientist knows that a great many things are not in our present state of knowledge. The good scientist is essentially a humble person. But you already have a great difference in that respect between, say, the scientist and the engineer. The engineer is a typical rationalist, and he dislikes anything which he cannot explain, which doesn't, can't see how it works. And what I now call constructivism, I used to call the engineering uh, attitude of mind. Mm. Because uh, the first phrase is very frequently used. We want to direct the economy as an engineer directs uh, an enterprise. The whole idea of planning is essentially an engineering approach to the economic uh, world. Well, I suppose if we include uh, in the intellectual classes, not merely people who have intellectual competence, but people whose work is with ideas, whether or not they're very good at ideas, that includes journalists, uh, professionals, government staffs, and so forth, uh, they not having the full intellectual understanding of the difficulties, would tend to be more arrogant in their assumptions about mm -hmm. what planning can do. And perhaps it is the explosion of those classes in modern times mm -hmm. that has led to uh, the acceleration of It's explosion, the partly the specialization. See, the modern specialist is very frequently not an educated person. He knows only his particular field. There he thinks, particularly if he's in any of the mechanical subjects, that you ought to be able to explain everything, that you can master the detail of it. Uh, I find, for instance, that on the whole, the uh, physical scientists are much more inclined to a dirigist attitude than the biological scientists. The biological scientists are aware of the impenetrable complexity, they know that you sometimes can only explain the principle on which something works without being able to uh, specify it in detail how it ought to work. The physicist believes that you must be able to reproduce every intellectual model in detail, that you really master everything. That's why I've come to the conclusion to say that uh, the physical science is really the science of the simple phenomena. Mm. As you move from the physical sciences to the biological and the social sciences, it gets into more and more complex phenomena. And the essence of complex phenomena is that you can explain the principles on which they work, but you never can master all the data which enter into this complex phenomena. Therefore, even a perfect theory does not yet enable you to predict what's going to happen. Because you have a perfect theory, but you never know all the data you have to insert into the scheme of the theory. Well, if the, if the uh, biologists are led to modesty by the fact that they deal with complex systems, why isn't the same thing true of sociologists who are not noted for their modesty? Or for a number of other desirable attributes they're not noted for? Because the whole science of sociology is based on the idea that you can explain society by a very simple model. Uh, I don't see any justification for the existence of the theoretical science of sociology, just as little as there would be no existence for the theoretical science of naturology. I mean, the separate problems of society are difficult enough, and to assume that you can have a simple theoretical model which explains the functioning of society is just unfounded. Sociology has done admirable empirical work on detailed questions. But I don't think there is such a thing as the science of sociology. You think the reason they haven't been led to a uh, modesty which would be more becoming to them is that they started with a theory about the possibility of understanding the mm. entire society mm. which has prevented them from yeah. seeing its, the impossibility yeah, of that? Yes, I. It's a very typical thing has been invented by Auguste Comte. 
was a prototype of my scientific approach. Well, you know, I want to go back for a moment to the uh, question of generality as a desirable attribute of law, uh, because I don't fully understand it. Why would it not be possible, for example, to state a progressive income tax in terms of generality? Anybody who makes more than $50,000 is taxed at a 70% rate. Uh, why is that not a general law which has unforeseeable consequences? Because we certainly don't know who's going to make that much money. On the whole, yes. I think the point is exactly that it is aimed against a class of known people. We, I mean, we know their names. Uh, but uh, I suppose one might almost say that in, of the in, criminal. In each group, People will know who are the people who will pay the high rate, not for the nation at large. And not for the future? Uh, for, it depends how far you extend the yes. future. Well, but how does that differ from the criminal law? If we, if we adopt a law against uh, uh, armed robbery, uh, we can identify sociological classes who will be mo more affected by that law than anybody else. Uh, we can identify, perhaps in some cases, individuals. Well, the purpose of law is not to punish these people, but to prevent them from doing it. It's an entirely different thing, to exclude a certain kind of conduct. But suppose a socialist society, or, or people with socialist impulses, said, we think it's quite bad to have a society in which people have more than $50,000 annually. Uh, and the purpose of our law is to prevent you. In fact, the income tax rate is 100% at $50,000. That would be uh, a general law and would meet the attributes of... of uh, maybe it's bad social policy, but, but as law, it doesn't like generality, does it? Well, uh, I admit this is a thing which has troubled me a great deal. Uh, what sense a uh, discriminating taxation, which makes income classes a basis of discrimination, can still be brought under the concept of a general law or not. It's perhaps, perhaps more a feeling than an, anything I can precisely justify. I mean, that you can carry the idea of uh, discrimination to a point where it's certainly an idea of progression to a point where it certainly is aimed at particular people, there's no question. But the principle of progression can be abused, mm -hmm. I'm certain. Well, you can draw any line within which is not yet <laughs> like abused, I doubt, rather. Yeah. Uh, I find the... Uh, I think I find the, the, uh, the attribute of generality uh, rather than specificity a very difficult one in many cases. Uh, yes, uh, I have also tried to avoid the term as much as possible that uh, rules which affect unknown people in particular circumstances, which are also unpredictable, is a phrase which I prefer to use which in fact has been elaborated, uh, arrived at by many of the 19th century legal philosophers. Yes, but it, uh, it excludes an awful lot of what social legislation that, that, we, that society demands today. If social legislation, well, it's wrong to say that society demands it, but that has has certainly grown up through democratic procedures. Oh, it certainly has. And, uh, but the question is precisely whether the powers of the democratic representatives ought to e extend to measures which are aimed at particular people or even particular known groups of people. But I take it, uh, let me understand that. Your objection to that could be of two sorts. It could be that it's, uh, there's something inherently wrong with aiming at a known group. Uh -huh. 
Uh, I'm not sure why that's true. Uh, or with coercive measures, I do apply coercion in a discriminating fashion. In the service functions of government, that don't apply. It's merely a limitation of coercive law. But why is it wrong to aim? For example, we regularly take, uh, or we used to until the all-volunteer army came in, but I guess we're going to do away with that eventually. Mm. We used to conscript yeah. coercively yeah. people of a defined class to mm -hmm. do our fighting for us. Uh, and that would seem to be a law of the very kind that you're objecting to. Well, the only problem is the discrimination between males and females. Mm -hmm. uh, the normal thing is, of course, that every man in, uh, has to pass in a certain phase of his age through service and was even tried to extend it if he was not suitable for armed service to replace it by another. So the duty should be the same for all men. The problem is one of the distinction between sexes. Well, uh... But even there, people have been insisting that women should do some sort of national service instead. Well, in fact, some of them are insisting that uh, women uh, be put into uh, fighting. And the only right. I've heard Margaret Mead object to that on the grounds that it would make wars too savage. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> it probably true. <laughs> <laughs> I knew the story about the French Revolution, the behavior of the women and the revolutionary crowd, which rather confirms that the cruelty of women is much worse than that of men. Well, we conscripted men in order to moderate war. <laughs> uh, and as we discussed your position, I was wondering whether there aren't constructivist aspects of your own outlook. That is, uh, you put upon the intellectual or the lawmaker the need to understand a system and how it operates and then to make adjustments in the system which uh, in a system that has evolved. No, I'm afraid that's uh, not what I mean. In fact, I'm convinced that you leave it to lawmakers to judge. They don't possess the capacity to decide. I want to do it in the form of a reconstruction of the mechanism. Two distinct bodies with different tasks so defined that a, a constitutional court could distinguish whether either of the two parties have exceeded their task. If you confine the one to laying down what I call laws in a strict sense, where for brevity sometimes use the phrase general law, but the thing this has to be defined much more carefully, and the other under this law entitled to organize services, but nothing else means services means directing resources put under the command of government, but not in a position to direct the private citizen at all. I think the mechanism of such a constitution would force the authorities to limit themselves because it would just be a situation in which nobody would have the power to do the kind of things. I mean, my, my constitution <coughs> indeed involves that certain things could not be done at all by anybody. Well, you put an awful lot of weight on judges there, and uh, I have some familiarity with judges. Uh. And what you're going to do, I gather, is have a one legislative body which may pass only general rules yes. of just conduct. Uh, and you will have a court yes. which uh, will have the power to say whether or not those are, in fact, mm. general rules yeah. of just conduct. Uh, you have somehow to insulate that court from the philosophy of constructivist rationalism. Yeah. Because if the judges, well, in this country already, our, our experience under the American Constitution yeah. is that for many years the Supreme Court of the United States struck down laws uh, interfering with matters within states on the uh -huh. grounds that they were not interstate commerce and the federal power extended only to interstate mm -hmm. commerce. The attitude of the, the political attitude of the country changed. The country demanded more regulation, or the New Deal demanded mm. more regulation. The court gave way, mm. and the court now completely has al almost completely abandoned that form of protection. It has now moved on, and I think it's significant, 
But the most frequently used part of the Constitution now is the Equal Protection Clause by which the court is enforcing the modern passion for equality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder, given that kind of institutional history, whether any institutional innovation can save us or whether it isn't really just an intellectual or political debate that's gonna, that will save us. And in my opinion, the American Constitution failed essentially because it contains no definition of what a law is. And that, of course, deprived the Supreme Court of guidance. I believe that instead of having the Bill of Rights, you need a single clause saying that coercion can be exercised only according to and now following a definition of law, which is of some length, but which of course e explicates what I in the brief phrase call general rules. That would, in the first instance, uh, make all special protected rights uh, uh, unnecessary. It includes all, it ex excludes all discriminatory action the part of government and uh, it would of course give that court a uh, guidance the court is still necessary because I'm sure that no definition you can now of law you can now put into words is perfect mm -hmm. you will in the course of time to have improved that definition that would be the essential task of that court if it understands that that is its main task, I don't think this perversion of the task of the Supreme Court, which has taken place in the United States, would take place. I can't exclude it, but I'm optimistic. Yeah, well, I guess I'm uh, take a little gloomier view of the, uh, yeah. of the possibility. Well, I'm, I'm not surprised that somebody who's been watching the development of the Supreme Court takes a gloomy view of <laughs> that. Because, you know, there is something like what you suggest in the Constitution now, which is the Equal Protection Clause. Uh -huh. And when you tell, which is like your rule of no discrimination. Uh -huh. And when you tell, two things happen. One is that somebody has to classify what things are alike uh -huh. in order to know whether there is discrimination. I know, I know. And uh, that means that you've handed the power, the ultimate power of mm -hmm. legislation to a court. Uh, and that's why I suppose I'm a little bit gloomy about the possibility of telling a court no discrimination and then leaving it to them to say which things are alike and which things are different in order to define discrimination. Well, if you confine the prohibition of, uh, of discrimination to the coercive action of government, I think it becomes much more precise. In the American interpretation, it has become everything which has uh, different effects on the people uh, to interpret this as discrimination. It doesn't require no discrimination in what the government does. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't want to pursue this too far, but I'm reminded of a Supreme Court case which raised this in extreme terms. Oklahoma passed a statute mm -hmm. uh, which said that, uh, in effect, that criminals convicted for the third time for a, a, a crime of violence, a felony of, uh, involving violence, should be sterilized. Their theory was that it was genetic. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. the, but the Supreme Court looked at that law and said, well, a bank robber who robs for the third time mm -hmm. will be sterilized, but an embezzler in the bank will not be. Those people are alike that's discriminatory, the law fails. That's my point. Once you give mm -hmm. this power to define discrimination, that kind of thing will be done. Yes. <coughs> I have no ready answers to this. Well, I, I, uh, my suspicion is that it transfers, that kind of rule transfers powers from popular assemblies to courts. And... Uh, and the other thing about it, if I may pursue it for a moment, is that uh, no two people probably agree which things are alike and which things are different. We all classify things slightly differently. Yes. So that if you have a court voting on it, although each justice may be perfectly consistent, mm -hmm. 
the, the output of the court will become incoherent because you'll get very different results as, you, as the votes shift on different issues. Uh, I, I, that's only a way of expressing my own reservations about institutional yes. cures <coughs> to, to what are philosophical problems. But it seems to me that you're thinking too much about the question of equality of effects and not equality of government action. On equality of effects, no two people will agree. I'm entirely in agreement with you on this. But when it comes to equality of treatment by government, and not including under treatment the whole results for the people, but only what the government does, I still believe you can maintain this. Well, I, I certainly hope you prove to be correct on that. Mm -hmm. We were talking uh, uh, before we began to tape this, uh, I thought it was kind of interesting, and I was hoping you'd repeat it, which is the, your view that the Marxists have the price theory upside down yeah. or backwards. And I wonder if you'd expound on that. Well, every belief that the prices are determined by what people have done is misleading. The function of prices is to tell people what they ought to do. And the Marxist idea is caused by a very primitive conception of the task of science. To think of everything being explainable in terms of a single cause and a single effect doesn't help us to understand complex self-maintaining structures. We are constantly have a sort of reverse causation. A thing is being maintained only by certain reverse effects, uh, something like the f negative feedback effect and that sort of thing. And in that sense, prices must be interpreted as signals of what people ought to do and cannot be set as determined by what people have done. And I would go so far that nobody, and therefore no Marxist, who believes that prices are determined by past event can ever understand the economic system. Marxism and every objective theory of value, even the Ricardian, blinds you to uh, the essential function of prices in securing a coordination in the market. Uh, the most typical instance is, uh, we have already spoken about John Stuart Mill, John Stuart Mill, who stuck to the objective value theory of Ricardo, was led by this to argue that while there are laws of production, there are no laws of distribution. We are free to determine the distribution, just because he did not understand that it was the prices which told people what they ought to do.